Alrighty, our first speaker this morning is going to be Lindsay Miller. Lindsay is a respiratory therapist at the Cystic Fibrosis Center of Idaho, located in Boise, Idaho. She um, will speaking today about patient knowledge and engagement during hospital admissions. Please welcome me in joining Lindsay. Well, good morning, everyone, <laughs> and thank you. Um, so, in case you didn't catch it, my name is Lindsay Miller. <laughs> I really appreciate everybody being here this morning. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about the patient acknowledgement and engagement during a hospital admission and how we are working to combine um, just that knowledge for respiratory therapists, but how we can actually help educate our patients to encourage more RTs. All right, so I have no relationships to disclose related to this presentation. So let's take a look at our learning objectives. We are going to <clears throat> describe the roles and the expectations of the respiratory therapist. Uh, not only during an inpatient exacerbation, but we'll talk about how we can educate in clinic as well. But more importantly, how we are going to provide our patients with the empowerment and the knowledge to be engaged in their care. We're gonna discuss the various tools that are provided to the respiratory therapist, as well as the care team for a hospital setting as well. Um, that's gonna be partnered with the knowledge and growth for the inpatient setting. Then we're also going to describe some other opportunities that are available outside of the hospital. <coughs> uh, this is gonna be just different involvements in other areas as well. So let's take a look at the past few years. Um, just by a show of hands, how many of you, are, this is your first in-person conference or you're new to your care center? Yeah, that's pretty awesome. <laughs> Well, welcome, and I hope you are all having a great start to your conference. Um, it's really, really great to be back. I know we've, we've said that probably at every <laughs> discussion and every meeting, but it is really great to be back. Uh, some of the other things that have happened in the past few years, obviously with Trikafta, we, at least our facility, I don't wanna speak for everyone's, but we had a decrease in hospital admissions. Um, we also had a decrease in CF exacerbations. Unfortunately, now we are starting to see those climb back up again. Um, and because of the increase in exacerbations as well as admissions, we're seeing now that with the hospital uh, staffing struggles that, again, not to speak for every faci everyone's facility, that hours, we're seeing a lot more new hires, travelers, just new grads, all of, all, all of these other individuals that might not be familiar with CF care. And that's been one of our struggles and challenges uh, and why I've um, tried to work on patient empowerment so that they can start um, assisting as well to be advocates for themselves. So as a lot of us know, I mean, we're just gonna take a look at our daily respiratory treatment regime. Um, this is just what a, a standard day would look like uh, for our, one of our respiratory therapists uh, treating a patient who's admitted in the hospital. And uh, with this, we've actually been able to pinpoint where we are struggling within the inpatient setting. So a lot of the struggles are just order of operations of medication delivery. And that's where one of those pinpoints we were actually able to educate and have our patients speak up of, hey, you know what, actually I do my pulmazyme after albuterol and so on and so forth. So um, having our patients with the confidence to stick up for themselves is huge. And uh, reverse isolation, infection prevention, just those basic items where I really appreciate you coming in, but I actually need you to step out and put a mask on and your gown. I, protecting themselves. Um, we've actually assembled a patient advocacy 
information packet uh, that we provide to our patients that they have if they have not had an admission in the past year or so. Some of our patients are actually experiencing their first admissions ever. Uh, with that, it just gives kind of a general outline of what to expect during their hospital admission and uh, who they can contact if there are any issues or um, if they need a power shake it for uh, nutritional needs. So we, we try to provide as much information as we can for our team to be that constant reminder too for the patient of, hey, we're still here for you and this is just your some educational tools. So this is part of our plan with this patient advocacy packet that we've completed. Uh, it is part of, uh, to educate the patient on their hospital admission. And then we don't expect them to have to chronically remember it too, especially they're, they're feeling a little under the weather. They don't feel good. They're in the hospital for a reason. So we have it printed out as that constant reminder. It also helps them show the care team of, oh, if I get a little confused, here's still my information. But more importantly, bringing it back to respiratory therapy, we want to create these opportunities for evolvement and involvement. Uh, CF on the Move is a great one, for example. Uh, we meet every other month, and we really try to bridge the gap in between our CF clinic and the inpatient setting. We meet to discuss how things are going on a good and bad perspective with our patients that are admitted. What information can we relay to our providers? Um, do we need to get, are there any supplies that are needed? So it's, a, it's been an incredibly beneficial meeting to have where we can find where our potential weak points are and we're all together and we can collaborate as a team. We also have our patient family advisory board that we can join and receive feedback from our CF parents, patients, and community. Uh, these are amazing tools and voices to be heard with just everyone who has their own personal experiences. With these, RTs are always able to be involved with this. There's no rhyme or reason. Be involved. Try and sign up. Um, it's amazing to hear what other people have to say. Um, let's see here. So that's part of our goal. We want to provide confidence in our respiratory therapists and expand their knowledge. More importantly, we want to provide the new hires and travelers a good base foundation of CF care. And I really, truly feel that that starts with our students and our patients. So as we actually kind of just heard, but I'm going to share my story again. <laughs> um, I became, when I became a respiratory therapist, everything had dramatically changed um, because of our CF community and the opportunities that were presented to me. Believe it or not, I actually wanted to become a dietitian. Um, <laughs> and prior to that, I, I went to culinary school for baking and pastry. So I didn't really have a love story with respiratory. However, when I started my first um, rotation as a student and I was at Sutter Memorial Hospital in California, the very first patients I treated were individuals with CF and they were in for their summer tune-up. At that point in time, their average life expectancy was in the mid to late 20s and that's about the age I was and it changed my life. Seeing these warriors and just how strong they were completely blew me away. So fast forward uh, 10 years later, <laughs> I uh, am now working in, an, in a hospital. We moved to Idaho on a whim. I had no idea about what I was doing in Idaho, just wanted to try something new. And little did I know that I would end up even here today. <laughs> um, we have... I, once I signed up with our CF clinic, I've, I've never looked back, and the opportunities that have been presented have just been phenomenal. Um, between CF on the move, the hospital at um, PFAB, and all of that, I just love being able to be here and being a representative for our I Idaho clinic. So I guess what I'm trying to say to wrap up is be the apprentice. 
Take the opportunities to learn and grow from your peers and be a team with your community. There are so many opportunities, you just have to discover them. Uh, I really wanted to finish today by thanking my team. They're all over there. <laughs> um, my team has made my career the best. Um, I wouldn't be able to do, I wouldn't be able to be here without them and how we've been able to collaborate as a team as well. So I just really want to thank them. I want to thank everybody for this opportunity and I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your conference. If you have any questions or if you just have anything you want to reach out, here's some contact information as well. Thank you. Do we have any questions from the audience from Lindsay? Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you. Our next speaker is my co-moderator, Abby Redway. Abby is a PD and adult respiratory therapist at the University of New Mexico. Today, she will be speaking to us about navigating the profession, helping grow, and support our own. Please help me in welcoming Abby. Good morning and welcome. <clears throat> My talk is helping to grow and support our own. I have no disclosures to disclose related to this presentation or frankly anything else. My objectives for today and my talk include identifying opportunities to diversify ourselves as respiratory care practitioners, to support, strengthen, and expand educational opportunities for others, and to build opportunities to advocate for our profession and our patients. Nationally, enrollment in the respiratory care programs is declining. There's actually a 27% decline enrollment in respiratory care programs since 2010, according to the NBRC. Respiratory therapists and other healthcare professionals are still reporting increases in incidence of burnout. Baby boomers are leaving or have left the profession and workplace dynamics are ever evolving and changing rapidly. We're also facing a doozy of a winter. In 2021, the AARC did a survey of 1,100 and 56 respiratory therapists. In that survey, one of the findings that I wanted to just share with you was 79% of those respiratory care practitioners reported they're still experiencing some level of burnout in their professional lives. We need to grow and support our own. The Cystic Fibrosis Foundation has clearly outlined some staffing requirements for our multidisciplinary teams. There is to be one provider for every 100 to 150 patients and a minimum of two physicians on the center team per center. As we're all well aware, there is to be one nurse, one social worker, one dietitian, and one respiratory therapist, a full 1.0 FTE, for every 100 to 200 patients. With the goal of one respiratory therapist for every 100 to 200 patients in mind, I serve approximately 140 patients between the adult and pediatric patient populations. My time on both teams, however, is sub subdivided into additional roles. By and large, these roles cross over within the care teams themselves, but I wanted to highlight my balancing act. I am, of course, the pediatric respiratory therapist. I'm also the respiratory therapist for an outpatient trach vent program that has just blossomed, we'll use that word, blossomed in the last couple of years. 
I am the adult respiratory therapist. I'm also the adult CF registry coordinator and still serve in a modest role as a research coordinator on both teams. I have mentored many as many team members have come and gone in the last few years. In the 2021 AARC survey, a positive view of leadership was proactive against burnout. Burnout was lowest in settings with high levels of leadership rounding, providing useful, consistent, and positive feedback. Still, even with the support of leadership and my wonderful teammates, some days I felt a little alone. From at least a CF care center role and FTE standpoint, I set out to learn. Am I alone? Do other RTs fill multiple roles? My CFF dot org's organizational search allowed me to search CF centers by name, state, or city. In this example, B is for Boise. I searched by city names alphabetically. It was easier to keep track of where I was in this, the search process as I worked alphabetically. As you could see in the previous slide, with the city name of Boise, the adult and pediatric CF centers and contact information was displayed. You can quickly drill down on any CF care center's team to look at the individual team members and their roles. We participate in the Mountain West Cystic Fibrosis Consortium. Our consortium consists of seven Western states. We tend to be much more rural states, and I like to think that we are just a little bit leaner, meaner CF care centers. We all tend to wear multiple hats. And this is how I found Lindsay. I wanted a peer from the Mountain West. There aren't very many of us, and I wanted to represent. So, when I was reviewing our Mountain West respiratory therapist, that's how I found Lindsay. I didn't know she was gonna be a celebrity at the time that I asked her. I asked her in February. And as you can see, um, this is her contact information. I was able to identify her role, her FTE, her years of service, and her role on both teams. Sorry, drew a little blank there for a moment. I reviewed the first 300 respiratory therapists that I could find. I made my way through care centers and teammates all the way from Albany, New York, to Portland, Oregon, alphabetically speaking. As I said, I collected the city, type of center, all roles des designated within this profile, the individual's email address, FTE allocation, and years of service in CF if provided. This is what I learned. From 199 care centers, 300 respiratory therapists, 50% of us work in pediatrics only, 30% of us work in adults only, and 15% are like Lindsay and I and work in both pediatric and adult cystic fibrosis care centers. I found most of us must already be diversified outside of our CF care centers most likely 
as only 18% of the respiratory therapists individually held a 0.75 FTE or greater within the care center. Opportunities that I have found to diversify myself include a credential that I earned early in my career, my neonatal pediatric specialty credential actually opened the door many years later to my joining the pediatric CF center. But that credential, the NPS, allowed me at my hospital early in my career to join our pediatric core. And when you join a pediatric core, additionally, you're reimbursed for your additional commitment to the facility but also your guaranteed staffing in a pediatric area for a minimum of 80% of your time. I worked weekend nights, and I loved it. I staffed in the pediatric areas or the newborn ICU 96% of my time. I was a true member of my teams. When I reached the point in my career where I could no longer sleep during the day, I had the opportunity to interview and was awarded the pediatric cystic fibrosis respiratory therapy position. Within that position, as I, I continued to grow as an individual and a professional, I earned a bachelor's degree in occupational education. My bachelor's degree has rewarded me in an additional uh, incentive financially within my institution, but that degree, that teaching degree, has been incredibly helpful in diversifying my skills and making me a better educator to my patients, a better mentor to those that I am cross-training or hosting, and a better teammate in facilitating projects and uh, collaborations with my multidisciplinary team. I also had the opportunity to cross-train as a research coordinator. Initially, it was out of necessity. Our research coordinator had left, and we had a multi-center clinical trial in progress with patients on drug. So my orientation was steep. And it was, it was a detailed study, and I lost one of the patients on study drug in the study. So when I waded my way through that, I learned to love research coordination. That set of transferable skills opened the door initially to a salary agreement and then a 0.5 FTE with the University of New Mexico as a research coordinator. I was a research coordinator for our center half time, technically, for five years. It was something I loved. I ate, slept, and breathed research. Um, I was lead coordinator on all of our clinical trials pertaining to cystic fibrosis. In 2018, our adult cystic fibrosis respiratory therapist retired. And there were multiple team members on that team leaving or retiring all at the same time. It was in part a personal decision and in part a professional decision, but I had the opportunity to have already established a relationship with many of those patients and providers. So that's how I came to be a 0.5 pediatric and a 0.5 adult CF respiratory therapist. But I still have a small foot in the research world. I'm a dual role respiratory therapist. And I set out, of course, to establish how many of my peers have defined roles within their care team in addition to respiratory therapy. Now, please keep in mind, I'm looking for the dual role respiratory therapist. There are many other opportunities in addition that a respiratory therapist can serve on a care team. 23 out of the 300 respiratory therapists that I surveyed have an alternate role in addition to being a respiratory therapist on their care team. As you can see, I've tried to illustrate those that also share a role as a program coordinator, a research coordinator, a registry coordinator, and then of course their F FTE for respiratory care on this slide.
We need to support, strengthen, and expand our educational opportunities for others. With looming issues affecting respiratory care, including burnout, dwindling FTE allocations, and staffing shortages for respiratory therapists all around, we need to focus on supporting those with less than two years of experience specifically and our village as a whole. In reality, those of us with 22 years or greater of experience would like to retire at some point. How can we support, strengthen, and expand educational opportunities for others? Within our own CF communities, participate. Do your CF QI project. I don't know what your QI project is, but it is worthy. I encourage you with all my heart, do your QI your QI project. Make that handout. There is so much personal investment in creating your own patient education tools. You will learn so much more than you thought you already knew as you develop and craft your own tools. They will also speak to your patient population. You know your patient. Develop your own tools. Be that champion. I am a huge champion. My championship is infection control. I don't know how or why this started, but years ago, I became the infection control champion. And to this day, that is absolutely one of my favorite things to harp on, to review, and to hope, hopefully, pass along. Within our own hospital, represent yourselves. Mentor those outside of your CF care centers. Collaborate with those unit educators. That was a relationship that was hard fought, but that relationship has definitely been mutually beneficial in the end. We have five pulmonary services guidelines specific to cystic fibrosis and my relationship with our unit educator is invaluable. Call those inpatient RTs. Pick up a phone. How long does it take to have a brief conversation? Information flows both ways. At my center, I take it to a little bit of a, the next level. My respiratory therapists know that they can expect a call from me every Wednesday morning just to touch base on the inpatients they were assigned. But also, they can expect a call back after we've rounded if there were any changes to the patient care plan. I also send out weekly emails to the respiratory therapists on the inpatient side and their respective core areas, highlighting the patient care plan, where we're at, and where we need to be. So every week, they get an email, so it's not just the therapist that was on service that day that got the information. Within our own communities, engage, please. Join the Cystic Fibrosis Respiratory Therapy Listserv if you have not already. Join a local respiratory care society. I ended up the president of our local society, the New Mexico Society for Respiratory Care during COVID. It opened doors and opportunities that I could not have imagined. I worked very closely with a representative of our governor's office. We literally had weekly calls at one point. I was the contact person for every single director of every single respiratory therapy department in the state of New Mexico. It was a lot. And at the end, I was very, very happy to become past president. But it was a wonderful experience. And my third suggestion, if something is stuck in your craw, please call or go visit a legislator. They need to hear from you. They need to see the boots on the ground and understand why these issues are important. Why do we need to represent ourselves? I hope I've highlighted a few reasons. 
We need, also need to represent ourselves to the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation, to our own care teams and hospital administration, and to our own communities. Tell them what you do. Tell them about your commitment to your specialized training. Tell them about the hours of service I strongly suspect you donate. Why? For our patients' sake. We cannot do what we do to help our patients if we don't help to grow and support our own staff. We need to protect and demonstrate the value of our own FTE positions. Here is my contact information from the myCFF.org organizational search. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions for Abby? Don't be shy. Thank you, Abby. Our next speaker for this morning is Lauren Willis. Lauren is the Cystic Fibrosis Program Coordinator at Arkansas Children's Hospital. This morning she will be speaking to us, to, to us about Beyond the Bedside, alternative roles for RTs in CF care from a program coordinator's perspective. Join me as we welcome Lauren. not the tech savviest, so give me just a second. <laughs> All right, you guys. So good morning. Uh, wow, it's so good to see everybody. I'm just going to echo what uh, others are saying. It's great to be here. I hope you guys are enjoying Philadelphia. Um, warning, I've missed you so much. I'm wearing a black lanyard and I'm a hugger. I'm from the South, so, and I've got like a couple years worth of hugs to give out, so <laughs> just warning. Um, thank you guys for asking me to be a part of the session today, and thank you guys for getting up early. It's, it was a little tough this morning. I know we all secretly sometimes miss the jammy wearing and the, the virtual sessions, but uh, um, for my topic today, we're going to look at alternate roles that our profession can hold maybe beyond the, the, the bedside as career growth opportunities. And as mentioned, uh, I'm the program coordinator, so I've kind of got my, my coordinator lens on for this session. I have no relationships to disclose. So for our objectives, we are going to um, look at possible roles that could be held by RTs within the CF center or healthcare systems. We are also going to uh, review why we're good for these roles. What are our transferable skills um, over other disciplines that have traditionally held these roles? And then um, I'll probably review a little bit, maybe overlap on um, Abby, or Abby some on uh, how we can prepare for these roles. So um, each of the speakers today has kind of shared a little bit about their journey and how we got to our current positions in CF care. So um, for mine, I actually started at Arkansas Children's Hospital in 1996. I'm dating myself a little bit. Um, I was a graduate out of respiratory school and my first assignments were children with cystic fibrosis. And I remember um, I was green, I was very inexperienced, and they were intimidating, <laughs> even though they were children, because them and their, both their families, they knew so much more about their care and, um, than I did. But they were always patient and always kind. I learned so much then, and I continue to learn from them now. Um, so I really enjoy my role. I, um, as some of my other colleagues here, I did a little brief stint in critical care, got my critical care jam on for a couple years, 
And then I took a um, position in the outpatient pulmonary clinic, um, working with all pulmonary patients, but this role also included being the RT on the CF uh, team. So again, my role was a little divided. As the last speaker said, I saw you know any pulmonary patient in clinic. But I also got to work alongside um, prior program coordinators um, during office time, and I was able to help um, them and learn a lot from them, like how to do office calls, how to work through insurance authorizations and appeals. Um, I had the opportunity to serve on the CF Center committees and participate in QI, so that in 2008, when the coordinator role opened up, the center director at that time um, not uh, suggested that I could fill that role, and that was really an honor because it had never been held by a respiratory therapist before. So he gained support from uh, my department in hospital administration. I've been in the role ever since, so and I love it. So I um, also just want to mention for those who, who may not know that the CF Foundation does require each center to have a coordinator as part of their accreditation, but they do not designate the discipline that holds that role, just that it cannot be a physician. So again, I think this really opens a lot of um, doors and opportunities for our profession to hold some of these leadership uh, roles in the center. So um, just thinking of opportunities for career growth, we're, we're talking about expanding the number in our profession, but we can also talk about expanding our profession within um, hospital settings. There are a lot of different roles we can, we can hold, and this is not an all exhaustive list, and as prior mentioned, a lot of these roles are often done in combination. So we do need strong RTs in uh, management or supervisory roles, especially those that have knowledge of CF, as these are the people that are gonna support the staff, the resources, and the services that we need to provide um, for our patients. Um, as mentioned, we can do data entry and serve as registry coordinators. We also are prime candidates to be research coordinators, or we often have the skills that are needed to do the outcome measures that are the primary study endpoints. So that could be things like the sputum cultures or the PFTs. And you're gonna hear about more of this from our next speakers. I'm not gonna focus on that too much. And then we're excellent as disease educators and um, uh, producing um, uh, care plans with patients, co-producing care and helping them manage their disease at home. Um, and as a colleague sitting next to me here just a moment ago mentioned, we're good QI <laughs> coordinators, <laughs> shameless plug. And then um, we can also be program coordinators. And this is not just for CF, um, as, as Abby mentioned, this can be for other programs as well. In my hospital, uh, RT serve as the asthma program coordinator the trach vent program coordinator, and they're also the, the coordinator in our sleep disorder centers where we're rocking it, like in Arkansas Children's, in these program coordinator roles. So why are we good for these roles? I'm a little bit of a movie buff, so I have some movie slides. So if you've not seen Taken, you won't get the reference. But Lim, Lim Newsom says it best, you know, we have unique sets of skills and um, this gives us a very broad knowledge, and our specific training is a foundation for these transferable skills that really um, make us excellent candidates for these roles. So what do we mean by a transferable skill? A transferable skill is a skill that is used in one position um, that would be useful in another. It is essentially a skill that transfers. Um, and these can be divided into two categories. We can um, have hard skills or soft skills. So the hard skills tend to be more knowledge-based and technical. Uh, they are something that you can usually quantify, measure, or demonstrate on a competency, like putting together a ventilator or using the vest machine. Um, where soft skills tend to be more subjective. Um, they're more personal or character traits. And these are um, examples would include like communication, your problem solving or the critical thinking skills, um, organizational skills, time management, leadership abilities. They're really um, quite, quite a bit of these skills. So looking, thinking of hard skills from a, from a coordinator perspective and what I think are important, and this is again not an exhaustive list, but um, our, our very, our medical training that we have um, 
as cardiopulmonary specialists really makes us exceptional candidates uh, for these roles. Um, we, as a discipline, have um, the most specific training to pulmonary disease anatomy, uh, pathophysiology, as well as um, disease education and disease management and pulmonary conditions. Um, and while I understand CF is not just a pulmonary-based uh, disease or pulmonary complications, pulmonary, pulmonary issues are usually the primary source of morbidity and mortality. So I really think our training as cardiopulmonary specialists gives us a little bit of a leg up maybe on some of our, our other disciplines that we work with. Maybe I should say a lung up, right? So um, as far as equipment, we have extensive knowledge on respiratory equipment used in CF care as well as the skills to operate the devices. So, you know, let's face it, as RTs, we have all the cool toys, right? So um, things I'm thinking about include our airway clearance devices, devices we use to deliver aerosol therapy, um, ventilation strategies, whether it's invasive or non-invasive, and then medical gas therapies. Also, as RTs, we receive focal training in respiratory pharmacology, much of which is used in the care of CF patients. So this includes things like bronchodilator therapy, mucolytics and hydrators, as well as inhaled antibiotics. I mean, as RTs, who, who else is going to know that Dornase Alpha is, you know, genetically produced a Chinese hamster ovaries? I don't know if anyone's ever had to fill those questions. But <laughs> um, and then, uh, let me see, I lost my place. So I do feel that my background with um, airway clearance devices and farm have really helped coordinate a position in many ways. I can help ensure my patients have access to current therapies, um, producing co-plans of care, it helps with insurance authorizations as mentioned, and troubleshooting and much more. Um, as RTs, we also have hard skills in the diagnostic um, tests and procedures often used in CF care. These include things like um, pulmonary function testing, sweat testing, um, polysomnography, sputum collection, and bronchoscopy. The knowledge of these tests and my roles also help me work closely with colleagues to develop um, our protocols and policies regarding testing. It helps me with awareness of uh, what the results mean and following up, result, following up on these results with um, patients and families. And just in general, um, other process pertaining to these procedures to be sure that as a center we're meeting guidelines as well as meeting our patient needs. So now let's switch to some examples of transferable soft skills. Um, soft skills, again, are essential skills needed to get a job done. They just tend to be um, not technical in nature. And I think as RT, some of us have these innately, but some of these we are going to gain through our career experiences. And again, this is not an all-inclusive list, but some soft skills I think that we have um, that are essential to um, coordinator roles. Definitely organization is a must. Um, I think RTs are already good at multitasking. <laughs> we have to do that a lot, and even in best ask care, and um, tend to be very detail-oriented. So in my role as a, a, a coordinator, this organization helps me prioritize my task and work more efficiently. Um, it also helps with improved flow of communication amongst my team, if I can be organized. It helps increase my productivity, um, not only for myself, but my team. And it helps me use my time wisely. Um, organization also helps me ensure that uh, I'm completing tasks and that I'm also uh, meeting the goals of my program as well as organization. And I also think good organization helps make everybody happy, if both your patients and families and your team members because you're handling things promptly and efficiently. Um, flexi flexibility and agility is something I think as RTs we demonstrate on the daily. I mean, we can rapidly pivot and manage changes at a moment's notice. I was really impressed and so proud of our profession and how we adapted to manage patient care during COVID. I mean, it was RTs, we had to um, obtain, learn, and implement things like uh, home spirometry, um, how to collect sputum cultures remotely, and uh, implement or utilize uh, telehealth. So um, as a coordinator, I was obviously involved in um, learning and helping implement some of these strategies during COVID. And <clears throat> I think there's a lot of benefits of us being flexible and agile 
is it just shows that we're committed to continuation of patient care. Um, it shows our engagement. It also helps us sustain our programs. It definitely promotes innovation and figuring out um, things we need to do uh, to make things happen. And as a CF community, I just was, I thought it was our flexibility really helped us through um, knowledge sharing and facilitating a collaborative uh, effort. So just a few other soft skills um, that I think are key. As a program coordinator, we're always looking, evaluating, analyzing, synthesizing information all the time, whether it's um, reviewing evidence-based practice, new research, new guidelines, even looking at our patient center specific um, reports to see if we have um, areas of improvement. Um, we also are usually asked to problem solve and often find solutions to difficult and complex situations. Um, that also includes realizing when there is a problem, identifying the issue and um, finding the root cause. The last two bullets I have here on communication and teamwork are actually part of interprofessional <coughs> collaboration. And communication is vital. Um, not only are we communicating with patients and families and team members, but also um, external providers, um, hospital administration, and even the National CF Foundation at the National CF Foundation level. Um, RTs are used to being part of a team. As uh, Lindsay mentioned and bragged on her team, we love team, our teamwork. It is so vital as a program coordinator. I mean, it's, it's invaluable. And uh, so I appreciate everything my team does for patient care. And then as a coordinator, I just kind of hub us together, kind of make sure we're all working in tandem, but couldn't do anything without teamwork. So if you're interested in career expansion, how would you prepare for these roles? And I think we have opportunities that exist at both the local and the national level. Some of it was also mentioned by, by Abby. But one of the first things I would suggest is consider advancing your degree. Most of the roles mentioned um, may likely require a bachelor degree or higher. Um, most institutions typically have a tuition reimbursement assistance program. Um, and you can also put it on your evaluation as a professional development goal. I also believe we should obtain a credential if you don't have one. You know, if we're gonna claim to be the experts, I think we should back it up with something. And there's different things you could consider getting a credential in um, based on your area of interest. It could be adult critical care, a neonatal pediatric specialist, asthma educator, sleep disorders, or pulmonary function testing. I encourage everyone to learn a new skill. Sometimes this means doing things that are uncomfortable, like speaking. <laughs> but the more skills you have, the more marketable you become, and it makes you a stronger candidate when these positions open. Um, it's also important to learn new skills to continue to grow. And I just put this little saying here because I thought it was kind of cool, but always don't open new doors. So learn and grow. Um, as mentioned, it's important to engage in different areas. So encourage engagement within your department, um, within your organization, or even within your CF center. Um, I know in our department, there's opportunities to show leadership like through maybe serving on the staff advisory council, or uh, like we just had Respiratory Care Week. Happy belated Respiratory Care Week, but we had an ad hoc committee that planned that. Um, and the hospital's always usually sending out a call for interdisciplinary representation on various committees, whether it's palliative care, your DEI, or infection control. Um, consider also uh, uh, taking some roles in your CF center on committees. And then even in your local chapter, you could do some um, volunteering and fundraising or advocacy work locally. Um, as mentioned, always jump in and participate in quality improvement or re research opportunities. And uh, lastly is be a yes person. All right, so I told you I like movies. So here's, I don't know whoever has seen the um, Jim Carrey movie in 2008. I may be dating myself again. But um, this is what I kind of mean about being a yes person. 
but it's a funny movie, but it's actually based on a true story of a guy named Danny Wallace who one time decided to say yes to everything in life. It changed his life, and he wrote a book about it. So this movie's kind of based on that, but in a humorous way. But Jim Carrey plays a guy who's stuck in a rut. He's depressed. He's very negative. Um, he goes to a self-help seminar, and he unleashes this power of saying yes. Um, it also shows you in this movie in a humorous way why saying yes to just everything um, is not realistic and can also get into trouble. So I just want to say we have to do it within reason because I can't bail you guys all out of jail. So um, I don't say yes to everything. <laughs> but um, I think the message, though, is that saying yes um, opens doors, opens opportunities and creates transformative experiences. So be positive, kind of live in affirmation. Avoid phrases like can't, don't, won't, that's not gonna work, it's not my job. Um, no one likes to work with negative people. So when you're negative, um, that's your normal response, they're gonna quit asking you or involving you. So just, just always try to be a yes person. Um, you also want to be reliable. So if you say you're going to do something, you want to do it and do it timely. Also show a genuine willingness to help and be part of solutions. Um, the idea is really to make yourself indispensable so that people think of you first. Like you're the first person they want to come to to solve a problem, to be on their team, to help. And again, that also means being open to change, which is, as you get older, that is a little harder to do. But... Um, you want to try new things to, for improvement. <clears throat> so things you can do to prepare at the national level. I'm going to echo what um, Abby said, which is to be a champion for the profession, our profession. This includes membership and supporting our um, professional organizations. I uh, also encourage you to serve on national committees, like the CF Foundation will send out calls or opportunities for RTs to be um, representatives. So if you sign up again, you're being a voice for your profession. You can also be a voice for your center and your patients and families. I also encourage everyone to participate in a CF Foundation a supported learning activity. And I did put a couple examples of here, some of the recent ones. Um, um, again, this is definitely not inclusive, all inclusive, but um, quality improvement training, the VIPF8 just launched, we'll be doing that. And if you haven't yet, um, the partnership engagement program is excellent. It teaches um, communication and relationship building skills. And after the training, you can be a pet champion for your center. Um, we also encourage you to participate in, in, in ACFC. So here, and I remember there's a lot of hands for new people or new new um, people to the program and I remember when I came to the first conference and I was sitting in a room and I was looking at all these speakers saying wow how do you get there like how do you do that so please if it's something you're interested in ask any one of us we will get you connected and plugged in and these are just examples of things you might can do <laughs> oh yeah and there's there's your person right here <laughs> you're two people <laughs> you got Donna too <laughs> um, but consider um, one of the easiest things is probably leading a luncheon roundtable. So for those who don't know, um, there are going to be some tomorrow. But it's a very informal session of about 10 people around a table having lunch, discussing a focal topic. Uh, moderators are needed for those sessions and ideas. Consider submitting an abstract that could lead to a poster. And then lastly, you could present here like this or moderate like, like this. Like this. <laughs> Um, then last, uh, not last but least, but we, we oh, also want to uh, echo the mentorship. That, and mentorship can really occur both at the local and the national level. Um, at the local level, you definitely want to mentor your RTs, mentor other CF team members or people with less experience in CF than you. Grow your students and disciplines that are in training through mentorship. I love working with our fellows. Um, and then at the national, ship is, uh, national level, mentorship is needed. As mentioned um, at the beginning of this, that there is an RT mentor program. We typically have more applicants than mentors, so if you are eligible, we definitely encourage that. And I promise if you serve as a mentor, you gain so just as much as your apprentices do. It's a great, great program. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Lastly, I want everybody to be a cheerleader. And I know that sounds corny. But cheerleaders are the people that lift you up. 
right? They make positive things happen. They are inspiring. They release the potential in others, and they bring out the best in those around you. I mean, and how powerful is that? If you can bring out the best in others. So again, be a cheerleader for the profession, be a cheerleader for your center and team and your patients. So in conclusion, there are uh, many alternate roles that RTs can consider for professional growth. Um, and that as RTs, we, we have a variety of transferable skills that make us excellent candidates for these roles. And I encourage you, if you're interested in career growth, to uh, start optimizing your candidacy by looking at things you can do at the national and local level. And this is my contact information, and I'm happy to talk to you directly or answer any questions. Thank you, guys. All right, Lauren, we have a question for you. Okay. Um, do you have a master's or bachelor's degree, and if so, what in? Okay. I do. I have a bachelor's in respiratory care, and I actually uh, just completed my master's. I was a late adult learner, <laughs> so you can do it. <laughs> it's not easy, but it's, it was it was very um, it was it was a great experience. So I do have a ma master's in um, health promotion, which is uh, includes um, like a health education specialist. So that that really gave me some new skills. I learned a lot of new things. I had to. My bachelor's was done about 30 years ago, so going back to school as an adult learner was uh, uh, very eye-opening and challenging, but it was very rewarding, and I did learn a lot. So, so, and that was supported by my hospital as well. So that's why I'm saying you can do it. Just do it at a slow pace. I had to do it over a slow pace. <laughs> but thank you for the question. Right. Um, next question is, uh, oh. sorry, you're not done yet, Laura. I'm not done. Oh. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> is there a CF specialty credential for healthcare providers? Um, not yet, but I'm, I, that has been mentioned in some of the program coordinator meetings I've been in. So it is an interest of people to have a specialty credential in CF. The original discussion was there wasn't, we weren't sure if there was going to be enough volume to warrant having that kind of uh, specialty credential. But I think if it's, if it's something we work with, maybe the MBRC, if there's enough interest and it's more um, multidisciplinary in nature, like the asthma, that you would have those numbers. So I do think, again, this is part of where you work with your um, national organizations and say, hey, can we get this credential? We're interested in this credential. And then, uh, you know, finding out what it would be to develop that program and sustain it through, you know, CEs and recertification. But yes. Thank you, Lauren. Thanks. All righty. Up next, we have Ms. Kathleen Hicks, who is a research coordinator at the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences. She will be speaking to you today um, beyond the bedside, alternative roles for RTs in CF care from a research coordinator's perspective. Please um, welcome Ms. Kathleen. This is the first time I'm giving a presentation, so be kind. <laughs> um, Lauren is at our children's hospital in Little Rock, and we are two exits away at the adult center. So thank you, Lauren. I probably stole some of her templates for this presentation. Um, and I'm going to be talking about alternative roles for respiratory therapists as a research coordinator's perspective. Oh, already knocked something over. <laughs> I have no relationships to disclose related to this presentation. Um, our objectives are to identify CF research positions that could be held by respiratory therapists, describe the transferable skills that RTs bring to the research role, and discuss how RTs can prepare for these research roles. 
This is my path um, for getting to the research coordinator position. Um, my picture is a picture of the Pacific, Pacifica Coastal Pathway in California. And that is, um, I've been home uh, a year ago and I took that picture. Um, it used to be a road, it used to be a utility road and used to go to the dump, but now it's this beautiful um, set of trails going over the hills to the ocean. And I'd like to tell people that my job picked me. I left home from Pacifica to go to Long Beach, California to study um, physical therapy. And six years later, I was one of three students to graduate with the newly offered degree in physiology, not physical therapy. My two fellow students, they went off to med school and I went to the beach. <laughs> what can I say? I was in school a long time. And by the end of summer, I got a call from the pulmonary physiology lab at the UC Irvine VA medical program. They offered me a research job based on my degree and the recommendation of a college friend who'd graduated a few years before me. My first research job, and I am dating myself here, was albuterol before it came on the market. And I still have that protocol at my house. It was a lot smaller than what we have now. Now, years later, um, after getting married and having my first child, we decided to leave California for less expensive place to live. Uh, we moved to Arkansas, never been here, didn't know anybody in Arkansas. Six-week-old baby in the middle of winter. I don't know what we were thinking, young and dumb. I couldn't find a job. My husband's also a respiratory therapist. He found a job immediately. I wasn't a respiratory therapy. My degree was in physiology. I couldn't find the research position, so I took a job in the clinical PFT lab since that had been part of my research position at UMS in Little Rock. I earned my CPFT and RPFT in 1991, again, dating myself. And after many years, I went on to, uh, went back to school to get a second degree in respiratory therapy. I did my courses online and my clinical rotation at Branson, Missouri. And I still continued to work in the PFT lab Monday through Friday. I was exhausted. After I graduated, Branson hired me as a PRN worker. So I continued to work in Branson, which was three hours away from where I lived on the weekends, and in Little Rock at the PFT lab, which was an hour away in a different direction. So when the RSC uh, research coordinator position opened up, and I was happy to apply for that. I continued in Branson for another year, but it was not practical for health and other reasons. And I wanted to focus on the research. Um, shortly after I started, our data entry person for the registry left, and I took on that role. And then about a year and a half ago, my lab assistant left, and I took on his role as well. So some of the roles that could be held by RTs in research. Research roles could include the research coordinator, registry coordinator, the regulatory coordinator, a project manager, or a research lab technician. And I've done everything but officially be a project manager. So what, what do these roles do? So the research coordinator is the one that's seeing the patients for the research study. And so I, I used to tell my lab assistant, I'm not the boss of you, but I am the boss of the study. Because I have to make sure that everything gets prepared and done. I have to identify eligible patients, recruit and consent, perform the study procedures, data capture, and data entry. And then I have to coordinate the study visits and the investigators and pharmacists and anything else involved in that study visit. Now for the CF registry, which is very important to tracking what's going on with real time now with patients with CF, we extract information from the medical record and we enter that into the CF, Port CF portal. And that's now real live time. So you can see the data immediately. They also have a CF smart reports that allows us to generate reports so we can screen for who's eligible for studies, 
who still needs certain procedures done that year. Now, the regulatory coordinator is someone who prepares and submits forms uh, and documents to the sponsor and regulatory and oversight offices. And obviously, the program manager is going to oversee all things from start to finish on a research project. They're tracking all of the activities from the feasibility, site selection, activation, the study itself, and the closeout. And then a research lab, if you're fortunate to have one, the lab technician is obtaining um, the specimens, processing it, and shipping it um, according to the safety standards maintains the supply kits and the, for the study visits. Uh, we use a cart for each different study, so it's the lab person's responsibility to set up anything that needs to be on that cart for that study visit that day. So transferable skills, like Lauren was talking about, it's skills of knowledge assessment, procedures, and soft skills. So knowledge that, that we have as respiratory therapists, we, know, we already know medical terminology. And believe me, we, we have people in the research coordinators who really start with nothing. And just knowing what these terms mean is so difficult uh, for someone coming in without a medical and certainly without a respiratory background. We know about anatomy and physiology, treatments and therapies, diseases and, and disorders, including cystic fibrosis, and conditions that are related to that as well. We know how to do patient assessment. We know electronic medical records and infection control. Assessment skills that we already have. We can review medical records. We can review medications and understand what they mean and maybe even how to spell them. We can obtain medical history, smoking history. We know patient education, treatments, and care plans. For procedures, in the PFT lab, we uh, learn to do accurate measurements of height using the stadiometer and weight. And we have a saying in the PFT lab that all men are six feet tall and all women weigh 120 pounds. So we don't ask, we measure. We can do vital signs, pulse oximetry, the bronchodilators, nebulized treatment, uh, blood draw, we do arterial blood gases, and thankfully for the patient, you know, we're usually only doing venous sticks, but it's not difficult to, do, to go from doing arterial sticks to learn to do venous draw. A spirometry is a big part of every research study, and so it helps to know that as well. Uh, some of the studies that we're doing have done the pheno to assess for inflammation in the airways, the six-minute walk test, and EKGs. Soft skills like Lauren was talking about. You really have to have a lot of attention to detail and you have to be extremely flexible. You know, if a patient says their car broke down and they can't come in or last week, I can't get out of work. Okay, I'm sorry, this is the first, you know, two week uh, safety check, you have to make it. So we split her appointment between coming in at labs during her lunch break and then completing the study after work at 6.30 last Friday, getting home very late <laughs> instead of preparing to be here. And, and you just have to do whatever it takes. You always have to remember that they're volunteering their time and their life to these research studies and these drug studies. But you do have to adhere to standard procedures, protocols, and um, SOPs. You have to have good communication skills because not only are you talking to patients, hopefully in layman's terms, their families, but you have to be talking to the professional people, the physicians, the pharmacists, any, and uh, the regulatory people to get the job done. We need to be able to work independently, but also work as part of the team, not only the research team, but coordinate with the care team. Some preparation to be in the research. Get involved in a research study. You know, be a participant. You know, they're always asking people to volunteer, healthy volunteers. Um, volunteer to be part of a, a research, um, do some of the research assessments. I know for uh, before I went into and it really helped me get the job, is that I was doing the blinded PFT part of a study. 
uh, because it had to be, could not be the coordinator. And so when our previous coordinator left, I was already part of that study in that capacity. And you want to learn about research practices and ethics, and a lot of times your institution offers that. Participate in mentorship programs. A lot of people have talked about that. Shadowing opportunities. See if you can uh, tag along with your research staff and see what they do, because nobody seems to know what I do at my facility. So some of them who may be here, now you know. Um, obtain knowledge and skills that you don't already have. Not all respiratory therapists are working in the PFT lab, so you may want to uh, work with them and learn how to do PFTs. And get to know the patients as people. It's really uh, made a big difference when I went in there that I had been doing PFTs on them since we became a CF center. And so I mean, I knew them from babies, even though they were adults, they were still babies. And, um, and so they knew me. One of the things they always told me was it was going to be so hard to recruit people. And everybody I asked said yes the first few years. And most people will still say yes if they're able to do it. But it really made a difference that I already had a relationship with them. You want to consider helping with the CF registry data collection. I could appreciate any help I can get because I am the only person doing the coordinator and the registry as well. So, you yeah, know, if you're here and you want to help, please, please do. And also, you need to understand what the difference is between research and practice or clinical care. I get this from the Belmont Report, which is a biggie in the research ethics field. That practice is interventions that are designed solely to enhance the well-being of an individual patient that have a reasonable expectation of success. As far as the patient goes, it's all about you. Now, research, on the other hand, is a systematic investigation, including research development, testing, and evaluation designed to develop and contribute to generalized knowledge. So things in the future. So it's not about you, but really it is about you. Because that's what we're all about, is improving um, CF care towards the cure. That was pretty fast, but this is my contact information. Thank you, Kathleen. Um, <laughs> do we have any questions from the audience? Okay, let me check this little thing here. Oh, it's going to run away. <laughs> um, how do you keep your tasks separate from the CF multidisciplinary team? Well, for the CF registry, I work very closely with the care team. I'm actually in the CF clinic every week. I've also been there forever and a day. And so, I mean, I can mentor new um, team members because I know all of the patients and most all of the processes that everybody are doing. And so I also give feedback what assessments people still need for that year. I'm like the registry police, not always appreciated, but, um, but as far as the research part, we really have to keep it separate. I mean, we try to be accommodating, and sometimes we'll do a research study on the same day, but we have to keep it entirely separate. Uh, there's confidentiality agreements. I think one of the hardest things was with Trikafta, we couldn't tell our clinical care team what was going on. You know, and of course we knew immediately. Now we started off with all but one of our patients was on placebo. So we really didn't know till open label, but it was immediate. And, and we were so excited, but you couldn't say anything. And we had to warn the patients. Vertex is a publicly traded company. You can't talk about it. We couldn't make them, but they can certainly make us because we actually sign a confidentiality contract to not talk about those things. Our, we, we let them be aware of what studies we have and, but while the study is ongoing, they really don't know what's happening, good or bad. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any more questions from in the audience? Well, I would like to take time to thank you all for waking up early this morning and joining us for our session. And we hope you enjoy the rest of your conference. Mm -hmm.